tasks which you've ordained. come to us at this time, great man of God and no stranger to this camp meeting, and many of us respect and appreciate him. We want to hear from the word of the Lord today. Praise God. Brother Bass, come to us. God bless you. Let's give the Lord a praise offering together. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Brother Davies. It is indeed a privilege and an honor to be here today in the house of worship and to be uh, among the people of God, those of like precious faith. And uh, we want to give honor this morning to the uh, good pastor of this local assembly and the host of this conference, as well as his family and all of the local church family here. We appreciate what we have already heard, what we have already felt, and I do believe that the Holy Ghost wants to do a greater work yet, amen, in this meeting. And so we uh, certainly appreciate the sound, uh, the certain sound that we heard last night from um, young men who are uh, coming up and following in the footsteps of other men. And to thank God for young men that are going to hold the banner high. Praise the Lord. Are you happy to be here today? Thank you, Jesus. We'd like to move right in the Word of the Lord, Luke chapter 23. And we're going to begin reading at verse number 26. Many things that could be said, but for the sake of time, I'd like to get right in the Word. I do want to uh, express my own personal feelings to my heritage. Uh, my elder in my life, my father in the flesh as well as in the gospel, uh, Elder J.T. Bass and my wonderful mother. Uh, my mother went to be with the Lord on the 31st of May this year in a very unexpected uh, situation in uh, our lives, but the Lord has been good to us. And I, as I have already said before, I say again, thank God that's one that the devil won't get. Praise the Lord. She died in the faith. And uh, that is a great consolation. Luke chapter 23, beginning with verse 26. And as they led him away, they laid hold upon one Simon, a Cyrenian, coming out of the country. And on him they laid the cross, that he might bear it after Jesus. And there followed him a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and lamented him. Verse 32. And there were also two others male factors, led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the male factors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he be Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And the superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew, This is the king of the Jews. And one of the male factors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Verse number 27 tells us that there followed him a great company of people. 
And for the next few minutes, I want to talk to this conference about the crowds at the cross. Praise the Lord. The crowds at the cross. Let's ask the Lord to help us here for a few moments. In the name of Jesus, praying for your touch, praying for inspiration of the Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Would you help us today, O oh God? We're leaning on you in this service. Not by might and neither by power, but by your Spirit. In the name of Jesus, we honor you, Lord God of glory, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Praise God. God bless you. You may be seated. It is commonly believed among us that are here today that the cross of Calvary is the pivotal point in the Word of God for all time as well as for all history. I believe it is also understood by us that everything before the cross points toward it and everything on this side of the cross points back to the cross. I believe there are many aspects of the cross and the events that surrounded Calvary that carry a very heavy import for us as apostolics. I believe beyond the greatest fact that it purchased our salvation. It has been the inspiration for songwriters, and it's been a fountainhead of material for the author's pen. To the preacher of truth, Calvary is a crimson stream that's filled with the golden nuggets of truth that enrich the lives of those that hear the preaching about Calvary. Calvary is the pivotal point when symbolism becomes substance. And when shadow becomes the real, and when tight becomes the fullness, Calvary is the fulfilling of prophecy and the greatest expression of love and the way that we, as the people of God in this hour, enter into the holiest of holies. I trust that we as apostolics never get weary with someone preaching on the important event of all time. Thank God for Calvary. Amen. Are you thankful for Calvary? Do you thank God for the blood? Do you thank God for what price was paid that we might have life and have it more abundantly? Hallelujah. And yet for all the sermons and the songs and the writings about Calvary, it is still, I believe, the most misunderstood event in the history of mankind. That very fact is evidenced by the scripture text that I have read to you here this morning. As I mentioned in Luke 23 and 27, it said that there followed him a great company of people and of women. I note at Calvary that there were three different crowds at the cross who tempted the Lord Jesus Christ on that day. And I am confident that the crowds of that day are the mirror of what we as truth preaching and truth believing and truth, apost uh, truth practicing apostolics have to contend with in our time. Amen. There are still crowds crowding the cross who don't have a clue as to what Calvary was all about. Amen. The first crowd that is mentioned here is in verse 35. And the people stood beholding and the rulers also with them. This is the mirror of the religious crowd that we are contending with in the hour that we are preaching the truth of God's Word. They tempted Jesus Christ. They derided Him. They sneered outright and said, He saved others Himself. Let Him save Himself. If He be the Christ, the chosen of God. This is the religious crowd who is without a revelation. They didn't have a clue then, and they don't have a clue now as to who was hanging on that, that cross. They had no idea who Jesus Christ was when He gave His life's blood that we could live and that we could have life more abundantly. Hallelujah! They didn't have a revelation that the one hanging there was the one whose going forth had been from old and from everlasting. They had no idea that it was Emmanuel being interpreted God with us. Hallelujah. They didn't understand that in the beginning was the Word. 
And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh. And it dwelt among us. Hallelujah. They didn't know that that was God in Christ. Reconciling the world unto Himself. That without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. They did not know that the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the ending, the first, the last, was there that day incarnate in flesh. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We are battling today a religious world that doesn't have a clue who Jesus is. But let me tell you who Jesus is. He's the rock of all ages. Hallelujah. Mm. Woo. Thank you, Jesus. And that's why that when they leave the cross, and they go to the watery grave to baptize their converts. They don't baptize him, them with him, but they baptize their converts with them. I'm glad I have a revelation. Oh, hallelujah. That neither is there salvation in any other, but there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Praise the Lord. That's why there has been a perverting of the Word of God. Because the religious crowd was only doing that and has done that which is convenient. But thank God for a people who understand that there is no name, there is no power, there is no glory, except that which is in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. Somebody shout, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The second crowd that tempted Jesus that day is found in verse 36. And the soldiers also mocked him. They jeered at him, coming to him and offering him vinegar. And said, if thou be the Christ, the King of the Jews, and save thyself. Each of these crowds cried out to Jesus, would you save yourself? Would you come down off that cross? And these soldiers represent, and they are the mirror of the crowd that we are dealing with in our time. That is the world. The world doesn't understand what the cross of Calvary is all about. They don't have a clue that the cross is about denial of self. It is about sacrifice. It is about making up your mind that the price is not too great to live for God. The price is not too great to have the Holy Ghost, to walk in the Spirit, to live in the Holy Ghost. They don't understand that living for God is about denial of the flesh. Jesus turned to Peter when Peter had said to the Lord, You will not die that kind of a death. And Jesus said, Get thee behind me, Peter. Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. For you savor not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Then said Jesus to his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Jesus established that the cross is about the denial of self. 
It's not living a, a selfish, self-centered life in living for God. But it's one that's lived to the glory and the honor of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. The world doesn't understand our separation. They don't understand that we have determined that we're not living our life for ourselves. We're not living it for the glory of flesh. We're not living it because of a carnal desire. But something within us cries out to be pleasing to the Lord of glory. And the only way to be pleasing to the Lord of glory is to take up our cross and follow Jesus Christ. The world is saying you can save yourself a lot of grief. You can save yourself mockery and shame if you would lay down your cross of holiness and separation from the world. But they don't understand our holiness, our separation, our righteousness is about the denial of our flesh. Praise the Lord. If Jesus Christ had yielded to the crowds that were at the cross, there would have never been a resurrection. There would not have never been the events that were subsequent in the history, in the Word of God, in the history of man, and in Jesus Christ's own life. But the cross, the cross, was that which brought to us what we enjoy here today. You and I have got to understand that we cannot cave in to a religious world who doesn't have a revelation. They don't belong on our platform preaching. They don't belong on our platform singing. If they don't have a revelation, they've got nothing to offer to our great truth, to our walk with God. To our relationship with God. Praise the Lord. Amen. We don't have need of that. Because first of all, they don't have a revelation. They got nothing to offer. And the pressure's on today for us to back off. As apostolic pastors, apostolic preachers, and not be so strong, and not be so straight, what denial of the flesh is concerned. I am in an apostolic conference today, am I not? The clouds of the cross today would tell us, you don't need all of that separation. That's not necessary. That's not needful. But all you need to do is go back to the Word of the Lord and find out that the glory of God only resided in the holy place. It's only come to that place that was separated. We've got to have the glory. And if we have the glory, it will be because that we have a separated church. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Come on, why are you why are you why are you continuing to stand where you stand? Why do you contend for what you preach? What you teach? Why do you contend for separation? Oh, hallelujah. Oh Lord help me, Jesus. We've even got an attitude in our world today and even among us apostolics that we don't need all of this in our conference services. Oh, praise the Lord! Let me tell you, friend, it's getting crowded around the cross. But everybody around the cross don't believe in the cross. 
that the cross ought to be believed in. Well, praise the Lord. Come on, preacher, back up just a little bit. Give us a little bit of Hollywood. Or give us a little bit of worldliness. Let me tell you what concerns me. It's not what we in this generation can handle. It's what the next generation of apostolics are going to embrace and tolerate. I don't want to have an attitude of Hezekiah that says everything, as long as everything's okay in my day, then let come what may for my children that come after me. I don't want to have that kind of a spirit. I want my children, I want my grandchildren to know the same glorious gospel, the same message of separation, the same truth. Praise the Lord. There is another crowd. And that crowd is mirrored in 23 and 39 when he said one of the male factors which were hanged, railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. Amen. This was a man who was in the same place that Jesus was. He was likewise hanging upon a cross. And I believe that there's a religious crowd at the cross who don't have a clue and don't understand. And there is a world out there that doesn't comprehend why we stand where we stand. But the crowd that disturbs me today is that crowd among us. Hallelujah. I said it's a crowd among us that's got a skewed attitude or, or, or even a concept of what the cross of Calvary is all about. It's that crowd among us that worries me. I say it's a crowd among us that worries me. That's looking at the Lord saying, Save yourself. That crowd among us that's looking at us saying, save yourself, preacher. Save, your, save yourself, evangelist. Save yourself, saint of God. Why do you make that kind of commitment, that kind of consecration, that kind of dedication to God? Why don't you save yourself all the worry, the toil, the pain, the agony? And here is the other man in the same condition, that other side of the crowd that looked at the one who railed on Jesus and said, don't you fear God? Oh, hallelujah. Don't you fear God? Which is one of the very areas that we are dealing with today. There is not the fear of God among us. When men can walk to the pulpit and without any compunction stand and say, everything I preached, it doesn't mean anything. Everything I stood for, I'll not stand there any longer. Where is the fear of God among us that has no compunction about changing the message about distorting the word of Almighty God. Oh, praise the Lord. The man that railed on Jesus wanted to change the message. He wanted to change the outcome. He had no fear of God in his life. The question that he asked was, don't you fear God? Don't you have any fear of God about what you're saying? That you would rail, that you would speak in terms as you speak. Oh, God, help me. Hallelujah. Jesus could do one or he could do the other, but he couldn't do both. He could save himself or he could save us, but he couldn't do both. And we can either stand for truth 
or we can go a different direction, but we can't ride the fence. We cannot do both. Either we preach truth or what we preach is being polluted. Well, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. There ought to be something get a hold of us today. There ought to be something rising up inside of us. A fear of God. God, I want to handle this word not deceitfully. I want to handle this book not in a, in a deceptive manner. But when I get in the pulpit, I want to preach truth and righteousness and holiness. I want to preach the gospel. Preach the message. Praise the Lord. God help us to maintain the integrity of the Word of God by preaching the Word of the Lord. Hallelujah. He could do one or the other, but he couldn't do both. And we've got to do one or the other, but we can't do both. Hallelujah. If you're preaching in a conference and you don't preach it at home, there's something wrong with how you're preaching and what you're preaching. Oh, praise the Lord. If you're going to take a stand in this kind of a crowd, you ought to be taking a stand in the home front also. You can't just look good in front of everybody else. There's a God in glory that measures the spirit of the man. Come on, I don't know what you came for today, but there is a burning cry in my heart. God help us as apostolics to get a fear of God in our heart about this great truth that we preach. Hallelujah. 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 We could use a baptism of the fear of God among us. Praise the Lord that we would not use this pulpit as a coward's castle to tell a man something from here that we're not man enough to tell him to his face. There ought to be a fear of God about this place. That when we're here, we know by the help of God that we're anointed. We're divinely inspired. That God is using us to preach the word of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Don't you fear God? Don't you have any fear of God? God give our children a baptism of fear. A fear of the Almighty. Oh, praise the Lord. I grew up in a church. I grew up in a home. That if I laid down at night having done something that day that I ought not to have done. Amen. When I laid down at night and I wasn't right, I had a fear of God on me. I was afraid the Lord was going to come. I was afraid the rapture would take place and I wouldn't be ready. But we got no fear of God today because our youth go out and commit fornication and then come to the house of worship and get right out of the middle of everybody else and shout. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I hope you will give me my liberty to preach the burden of the spirit that I feel here today. Oh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I pray that we never cease shouting. I pray we never cease dancing and running the aisles and leaping for joy and glorifying God. But I pray that our worship 
does not become a mask for that which is unholy and that which is ungodly. Oh, God help us, but that our worship will be that which elevates us into the realm of God's Spirit and get the touch that we need. <sighs> Praise the Lord. The crowd among us that wants to change the message. They got no fear of God. I said no fear of God. No fear of God. Hallelujah. Backing up. Opening the door for Hollywood. And I don't care what form it is. Amen. I said it doesn't matter what form it is. It can be television. It can be video. It can be books. It can be magazines. It doesn't matter what form Hollywood comes in. She's still vile. She's still ungodly. She's still a reproach to everything that's morally right. Praise the Lord. Amen. No fear of God. Help me, Jesus. Hallelujah. Is it any wonder that our youth come to church dressed the way they do sometimes? This book tells me that we are the ambassadors of Christ. And I know that styles change, styles come, styles go. But the thing that concerns me, it's more than the style that I'm seeing. It's an attitude. It's a spirit of casualness. A spirit of sloppiness. Well, praise the Lord. You may come to God and have nothing more than a broke down pair of tennis shoes and a pair of worn out blue jeans and a t-shirt that's got some kind of ungodly appearance about it. But somewhere, some way, God can get a hold of your life and the Lord can change your circumstances so that when you come out of that world and you get a fear of God, somehow you want to represent Him in everything you do, every way you look, you want to give God some kind of glory. Oh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Forgive me. I, I wouldn't plan on saying all this, but I feel a touch of the Almighty here today. I got to hurry. Hallelujah. Come on, church. Amen. The spirit of casualness that has invaded the corporate world of America, where they used to wear neckties and dress shirts and long slacks, and now coming in with shorts and cut off blue jeans and t-shirts, and that's accepted in the world today. And what bothers me is that same spirit of casualness has invaded our congregations. Oh, hallelujah. There's something in the Scripture that tells me that the kingdom of God suffers violence. And the violence, if you're going to get a hold of this thing, you've got to have more than a casual attitude. It bothers me when I see our youth looking like a bunch of hoods running around town. Come on, church. Hallelujah. You can't tell them from the rest of the crowd. They look like everybody else. They got their hats turned backwards. They got their britches about halfway down. You know what? Amen. They got their clothes so sloppy. I'm ashamed. I said, I'm ashamed. Oh, God needs to have somebody that'll rise up and preach about the fear of the Almighty. Oh, praise-
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It's getting crowded at the foot of the cross. Hallelujah. My dear brother, don't you have any fear of God? To get in your pulpit and soft soap it and back up and take a limp wristed. Oh, hallelujah. Jellyfish backbone approach to the glorious word of the eternal God. Oh, God help us. There are those among us uh, who would like to extract the pain of the cross uh, out of the preaching of Calvary. We need someone who without fear and without favor will still grace our apostolic pulpits uh, with a message uh, that declares God changes not. His word changes not. And the truth still marches on. defy the crowd that tells us you don't have to be baptized in Jesus' name to be saved. I defy that crowd that says you don't need the Holy Ghost speaking with other tongues. I defy that crowd that tells us repentance is no longer necessary. Let's clap our hands to him. Apostolic in the house that would cry out, preach out, preach to me. I want to be saved. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It's not enough that we fight a religious crowd without a revelation, and it's not enough. That we have to contend with the world out there that don't have any concept of God and why we live the way that we live. We got to fight among us to stand for truth. Oh, praise the Lord. Men that come and say, you know, we need to move up a little bit, you know. I mean, after all, this is 2001. And it is a more modern age and a more modern time. It may be more modern. And it may be a more modern time. But the age-old truths of the Word of God transcends every generation. His truth endureth to all, to all, to all, to all generation. All God needs is a man that will stand for that truth. The question is, do you fear God? My dear brother, if you keep them on your pews because of their money, you'll keep their money and their problems. Oh, hallelujah. If you're playing tiptoe to the tulips, and you're more afraid of the pew than you are the throne. If you've got more fear of people than you do the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Is there a witness in the house? Praise the Lord. Amen. Something I note here. When we try to save ourselves, we lose ourselves. When we start trying to save ourselves from all of the... And don't tell me you don't get buffeted by your own brethren. That you have men look at you and laugh in your face. You mean you're still preaching that message you preached? Oh, hallelujah. My first visit to Little Rock, Arkansas was 30 years ago this month. My wife and I were newlyweds of about three months. 
When we preached here, visited the camp meeting, preached in the old tabernacle on a Friday and Saturday and Sunday. Amen. Well, hallelujah. I like what I saw then in the church that I was a part of. I like then what I saw in the kingdom, and I still like it today. I'm talking about the church as a whole. Those that are taking a stand for truth. Amen. And when we start trying to save ourselves from the ridicule, and save ourselves from those who want to make fun. I started preaching when I was 16 years old. Brother, Brother uh, Alviar beat me by two years. But I started preaching when I was 16 years old. I'm clocked about 32 years this year with the help of the Lord. I got no desire. I've been made fun of. I've been talked about. I've been made fun of because I believe in holiness and separation from the world. I've been ridiculed because I believe in revival and reaching a world that's lost. Are you saved when you're sitting? No, don't believe I'll ever save my city. But I believe there's some souls in that city that God wants to deliver and bring them out of darkness. Somebody shout praise the Lord. Amen, amen, amen. When David stood on the battlefield and his brethren looked at him and said, David, you're just a lad. What are you doing out here? You're naughty. What are you doing on the battlefield? David recognized when he said, is there not a cause? Is there not a reason to fight? Is there not a reason to stand? He was resisted by his brethren when he wanted to attack a giant that threatened the welfare of the people of God. And brother, I'm going to tell you right now, we will be resisted when we want to take a stand for righteousness. When we want to rise up in defense of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we want to point our finger to, at the face of an ugly giant and tell him, you come to us with sword and spear, but we come to you in the name of the Lord God. He was resisted when he wanted to take a stand against that which threatened the people of God. And when he brought the ark of God back to Jerusalem, amen, and he was shouting, dancing before the Lord with all of his might. Hallelujah. His desire was, I want to get the glory back. I want to have revival. I want to have restoration. I want to see God back among the people of God. And he come dancing, danced up the steps of his house that day. And there was a woman looking out the window. His wife, the Bible said, Michael Saul's daughter. Funny it didn't say David's wife, though she was his wife. Sounds to me like she's being more identified with her daddy than she was her husband. Huh? She looked at David and said, just who do you think you are? I'm telling you, brethren, we're going to be resisted if we preach holiness, if we preach separation, if we preach against those things that take that are threatening the church of Jesus Christ. And we are going to be resisted if we preach revival, if we preach the move of the Holy Ghost, if we preach the return of the glory of God in the apostolic movement. We're going to be resisted. So you know what I say? Just let it happen. Amen. Get used to it. It comes with the territory. Preach. 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 Don't be a crowd of the cross that wants to defy everything that the cross stands for. Let me hurry to a close. Amen. There's something I want you to note in all of this. There was only two crowds. Or there was only two kinds of people that Jesus spoke to from the cross. Praise the Lord. Whenever the religious world ridiculed him, he never answered them. And he's not talking today. I don't care what they say. He's not talking today to those who don't have a revelation. 
They can talk in tongues, give their message in tongues to say, Thus saith the Lord. But God does not give a message by the Spirit to those who don't have a revelation. The only way He's going to talk to them is that they're hungry for truth and He begins to reveal to them truth. He's bringing them the truth. But He don't call them my people. He doesn't. I said He don't call them my people. That's nothing more than a trick of the devil to keep people in the darkness of false doctrine. He doesn't talk to those without a revelation. He did not speak to the religious world of his time from the cross. He did not speak to the world when the world says, if you're the king, save yourself. Praise the Lord. He didn't talk to the crowd on the cross who was in the same position he was in. Who said, if you're the Christ, save yourself and us. And I'm telling you, he's not talking to the crowd among us. There's another spirit that's leading them astray. Help me, Jesus. Hallelujah. There's another spirit directing them in the direction they're going. It's not the spirit of God. Because God is not going to lead anybody away from holiness. He's not going to lead anybody away from separation. He won't lead anybody away from His name. He's not going to lead anybody away from the message of salvation. But He looked at that man on the cross who said, Remember me. And Jesus said, I'm going to say something to him. He's a man I'm looking for. He's got a fear of God in his heart. He's got a fear of truth. He's got a fear for righteousness. And I'm going to say something. This day be with me. I, I don't know about you, but there's a cry in my soul. I want to hear the Lord say, come on. I want you to be with me. I'm going to walk through the glories of revival. And I want you with me. I want you to... Oh, hallelujah. He spoke to those who feared Him. He looked from the cross. And He saw His mother. And His mother, Sister Mary. And He saw Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw His mother... And the disciples standing by, whom he loved. Whom he loved. He said to his mother, woman, behold thy son. And to the disciple, behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her into his own home. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's something about having a love for God. There's something about having a fear of God that attracts the attention of the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. He looked, he looked, he looked, you hear me? He told the man that feared him, you're going to be with me. You're going to be beside me. You're going to dwell with me. And he told the man that loved him, I've got some responsibilities I want to give to you. I'm going to place in your safekeeping my church. I'm going to place in safekeeping the mother of us all, Jerusalem. I'm going to, oh, hallelujah. I'm going to, because you love her. Because you love her. Because you love me. I'm going to give you some responsibility in the kingdom. He only spoke to those from the cross who feared Him and those who loved Him. And if you hear from the cross today, it's going to be because you've got a fear of God in your heart. It's because you've got a love for God and truth. Hallelujah! And if you don't have that in your heart, my friend, I'm telling you, you're not going to hear from the cross. You're not going to have true revival. There won't be a Pentecost among us. Jesus began His ministry among those that he prophesied that he would. Let me please point this out before I quit. He began his ministry among those that it was prophesied that he would start it with. When he left Nazareth, he came to Capernaum, and he, which is on the sea coast, and he came to the borders of Zebulon and Nephthalim, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah, the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulon, the land of Nephthalim, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light. 
And to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. And from that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It seems pretty evident that the majority of Jesus Christ's ardent followers were men that he chose from out of Galilee. They came from the tribe of Naphtali and Zebulon. Praise the Lord. They came from the shores of Galilee. Because when you read Acts chapter 7 and verse number 2, hallelujah, you understand that Pentecost came to the tribe of Naphtali and the tribe of Zebulon because they settled around the shores of Galilee. And that's where Jesus started his ministry. That's where he chose most of his followers. Praise the Lord. Because in Acts chapter 2 and verse number 7, they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? It was upon Naphtali and upon Zebulon. We want to talk about Judah and praise? Let's talk about Naphtali and Zebulon. They were the ones who had Pentecost first. When I discovered that one day, I asked myself the question, why? Why did God choose this group to be His closest followers, number one? And why was it upon them that the Holy Ghost was poured out at Pentecost? And I looked back through the Word of God, and I discovered something in Judges 4 and 5, that in one of the most important battles in all of Israel, as a matter of fact, it was so important that God chose a woman to lead in battle, who was not even supposed to lead in the battle. God wanted to see the victory take, take place so much that He let a woman lead in the battle. Deborah, am I right? Am I in the book still? He let a woman lead in the battle when it wasn't even the will of God for a woman to go forth to battle. But He let Deborah lead in the battle. Oh, hallelujah. And when you read Judges chapter number 5, you're going to find out of all of the tribes, out of everybody that was invited to go to war, they all had their excuses. And they all had their reasons why they couldn't go. We can't go. We've got to save ourselves. We've got to watch the sheep. We've got to take care of the boats. We've got to do this. We've got to do that. But the book emphatically declares that Zebulon and Naphtali were a people that jeoparded their lives unto the death in the high places of the field. As a matter of fact, that battle was so important that one city uh, that, that, that did not get involved, Mirage, that would not come to the aid of the Lord and the people of God, God cursed them bitterly. Because they wouldn't fight. They tried to be neutral. They tried to be neutral. They wanted to say, we can't fight for you, Israel. And we're not going to fight with God. And neither are we going to fight with the world. I'm telling you, Jesus said, you can't be neutral in this thing. Either you're with me or you're against me. And by virtue of the fact that you're not standing with me, you're standing against me. And so it was Zebulon and Naphtali who were a people that jeoparded their lives unto the death in the high places of the field. The Bible even tells us that when it came time to bring David back to Jerusalem, it was Zebulon and Naphtali that was involved in escorting him back to the throne. They were a people who were not concerned about saving themselves. Hallelujah. If it means going to war and paying with my life, if it means paying with my life to stand for this truth and to stand for the cause of the kingdom, and when the Lord, I just have a feeling that when God looked down and saw the tribe of Zebulon and Naphtali, who said, we'll go fight and we'll jeopard our lives even unto death if it's necessary. We don't care what happens. The cause of God is great enough and more powerful enough and wonderful enough that we're going to stay with the Lord and we're going to stand for this truth and we're going to walk with God and we'll fight this battle. Hallelujah! And it was to that kind of a people that had a Pentecost where the whole world began to be affected because there was an attitude among them that said, we won't save ourselves. We're not going to save ourselves. We're willing to give everything to God. I submit to you this morning. Amen. That there are crowds at the cross. 
that we are contending with. I trust that in the year 2001, sitting in this house today, our men, our saints, pastors, evangelists, that look at the cross one more time and say it's worth it all. I'll give my life to the cross. I'll give my ministry to the cross. Oh, hallelujah. I will not offer my ministry upon the altars of convenience. Oh, God help us. Hallelujah. I will not give my life in my walk with God and what I believe. I will not sacrifice it on the altar of self-will. The altar of convenience and things that I want. But I'll surrender and I'll preach the Word of God. Hallelujah. The cross of Jesus Christ still remains an ensign on the hill. And we have got to make a decision because you can't do both. It's either preach it or preach something else. Hallelujah. Is it to stand for truth and righteousness or go the way of a world that don't have a revelation and go the way of a religious world that don't have a revelation or go the way of those among us who are choosing to no longer fear God but preach the dictates of their own conscience and their own desires. I want us to stand right now. The Holy Ghost is in this place. The touch of God is in this house. Praise the Lord. We need a spirit of Zebulon among us. We need a spirit of Naphtali that says, whatever it takes, whatever it takes, the cross, I am set in defense. I will defend the cross. I will defend what the cross stands for. I will defend the truth that the cross embraces. Anybody in the house feel that way? Would somebody pray, God, give me a spirit of Zebulon. Give me a spirit of Naphtali. I want a Pentecost. I want a glorious Pentecost. A Pentecost that affects my world, my city. Those that I come in contact with, would you lift your hands and glorify the Lord, everybody. Oh, let's worship the Lord, everybody. Though our sins are scarlet You have made us white as snow Though our sins are scarlet You have made us white as snow Flows. Take the stains, make it wider than snow Like a tide, it is rising up Deep inside a current that moves and makes you come alive Living water that brings the dead to life Jesus, the only one who could ever save.